want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you so much for joining the NYU Stern Center for Sustainable Business Fireside Chat with Paul Pullman, who is both an incredible business leader and a sustainability visionary. Someone who I got to know, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about that when uh, he was running Unilever. Um, just a minute about the Center for Sustainable Business for those of you who don't know us. Our, our mission is to help current and future business leaders really embed sustainability core to their business strategy and help them drive innovation, operational efficiency, risk mitigation, uh, employee engagement, as well as benefits to society. And indeed, that's a lot of what Paul has done throughout his career. So really looking forward to hearing from him about this. We also have educational programs for undergraduates, graduates, and executives. And I wanted to highlight that in case any of you need student interns or people um, who uh, are well-trained and want to hire them. So we're always looking out for our students. Uh, we also do a series of events like this one, and we also conduct research around the obstacles and challenges to scaling up sustainability, again, the topic of our conversation here today. So I um, had the privilege of meeting Paul back when he moved from Nestle to Unilever and became the CEO. And I was running the Rainforest Alliance at the time and was working with them on their sustainable sourcing. And they were doing a good job and there were some interesting things happening there. But when Paul came, it was a ma massive transformation. The, uh, he, with his team, made a commitment to ensuring that their sustainability journey was, in fact, their business plan. So he created the Sustainable Living Plan, which was the business strategy, with really um, audacious goals like, uh, you know, having their environmental footprint, supporting half a million small producers around the world, 100% sustainable sourcing, and a variety of other targets that they've been reporting on and doing really well on. Um, and since then, a lot of other um, commitments. Paul also, during this time, led the business um, uh, uh, engagement around the development of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which prior to then, there really had never been a business engagement when the UN created the Millennial Development Goals prior. And that was a really, um, uh, as well, imp incredibly important contribution to engage business in this roadmap for sustainable development for the planet. Um, and then um, after he left Unilever, he has now launched a new uh, endeavor called Imagine, and we'll hear more about how we imagine, imagine uh, later. So um, I want to ask all of you to feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A during the course of the conversation, and we will come to those at the end of the talk. So Paul, we had a, a good um, pre-conversation, and um, one of the things we talked about is what does it mean to be human? Um, what do we do when we're not working or trying to save the world? <laughs> Can you share with us how you keep the right balance, what you like to do for fun, these types of things? Well, thank you, Tansy, and obviously thank you for what you're doing with the uh, Center for Sustainable Business, and I'm certainly looking forward to this uh, talk. But, um, well, to be human, I think, is, uh, is what is needed nowadays. We have, for most of the challenges that are out there, we have the solutions, but uh, for some reason, we can't muster the collective uh, energy to do something about it. So we've distilled everything down to numbers and spreadsheets and shareholder primacy. And, uh, and being human, to me, is the broader concept of really starting to address the issues that we will be talking today. But um, on a personal level, um, it's very important to, uh, I've always believed that, to have your physical fitness in order to have your emotional fitness and then moving into mental fitness and, and finally spiritual fitness. And if you can work that triangle and work on that uh, continuously, you have a very good life. Obviously, the spiritual one is being purpose-driven. What gets me up in the morning indeed is the ability to work on some of the bigger transformations that the world now needs, realizing that we are the lucky ones and need to put ourselves to the service of others. But I also get up in the morning now, especially during COVID, to have my trainer on Zoom and uh, start with an hour's exercise. And uh, that's important. And then we've changed our eating habits. One of the um, people that is uh, really helping us with uh, Imagine is uh, Susie Cameron. And um, she's written this book, uh, One Meal a Day to Go to Plant-Based Meals. And one of the things we need to do 
is obviously uh, balancing our menus and diets and, and getting out of meat is one of the things we can do to some extent uh, to help climate change. So I've tried to do that as well. And for relaxation, I like to read books. I'm a ferocious reader, but also the many articles. And, and frankly, I read too much, I have to say. We were just talking that. <laughs> so, but, uh, but for some reason, I'm addicted to the news as well and, and reading some books now and then I find very helpful. The last one I read is called uh, Humankind by a Dutch writer from my fellow country, uh, Rutger uh, Bergman. And uh, it certainly was reading because it really um, gives you a little bit more confidence that in essence, uh, human beings are good. And uh, that is what we need, at least that level of confidence to attack these issues. If you look at the news sometimes or politics, you might not believe what I'm saying, but in essence, we're good. And that is worth living for. Thank you, Paul. That's uh, inspirational. And it sounds like a good book for us to read in our dark moments. <laughs> so thank you for that. And also, I think your point that uh, it's personal, right? How we conduct ourselves um, and ensure that we have balance also helps us figure out how we have balance in the world. So we you also- You cannot work on a sustainable world if you're not sustainable yourself. Exactly, very good point. So we also talked, we had a fascinating conversation about some of the systemic challenges that society is facing, the role of business and other players and how we go faster and bigger on that sustainability journey. So let's start there, right? So there are many challenges confronting society today, climate change, COVID, racism, inequality, unemployment. I mean, the list goes on. So what is the role of business versus the role of government or nonprofit organizations? And how can business work constructively with these other stakeholders to get solutions to scale faster? Well, the, obviously, I think what COVID has shown us is indeed the interrelationship between all these issues. Uh, a crisis that has uh, started with the symptoms of a health crisis, people now understand it's actually a crisis of biodiversity, climate change, human health, inequality, um, uh, economic uh, development, all interrelated. And it gets to the heart of the uh, sustainable development goals where um, I think the main priorities that we need to focus on in the end is the climate change and inequality. And most of the other goals directly or indirectly are related to that. Um, it's very clear that um, we, um, the, the problems that we have created with our current economic system uh, cannot be solved at the same level as these problems were created. And we need to form different types of alliances, partnerships, uh, different designs of our boundaries and economic systems, and that requires all of us. So whilst I will answer many of the questions from a perspective of the business community, I do want to stress that uh, I'm not advocating that business can all of a sudden have all the solutions when they also have been a big part of the problems. What I'm advocating is really that uh, governance right now is difficult globally for many reasons we can talk about. And uh, yet more and more of the issues that we have, like climate change, the pandemic, uh, financial markets, cybersecurity are global issues. And what I'm advocating is that the heart of the economy, which is the private sector, which ultimately represents many of the citizens of this world. And in many countries, it's, uh, you know, it's 50, 60 percent of the GDP. Uh, it's 70, 80 percent of the financial flows or more. Uh, 80, 90 percent of the job creation that the fun, that the private sector has to step up to collectively get together with the responsible businesses to create a critical mass to then enroll civil society and hopefully help together to de-risk the uh, the governmental processes. We saw that at the time of Paris with um, on climate change. We're seeing that now on other issues where citizens' movements and private sector go together and then incite governments to move. A good example in the US is the, uh, the speaking out when there were so many discriminatory laws on the books on for the LGBT community, for example. So I believe in that firm partnership, goal number 17 of the SDGs, but I also believe that business has benefited tremendously from good governance in the past and economic growth. Now that we go through a difficult period, business has to take that responsibility and cannot stay on the sidelines of a system that gives them validity in the first place. Thank you, Paul. So on that note, talking about business um, and their role, we had, as you know, this, this far-reaching shift 
in a statement about the purpose of business from the business roundtable, committing to stakeholder capitalism, which you know we all applauded, and we've seen other the Davos manifesto this year, et cetera, talking about the need to move from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Unfortunately, there's a recent study that that came out that demonstrated that um, those companies that signed on many of them did no better than conventional companies and in some cases worse. For example, during the coronavirus, uh, sort of during the pandemic, some have continued to issue share buybacks while laying off workers. So my question to you is, you know, is a transition to stakeholder capitalism possible? And I know you have an opinion on this, having worked hard on it. And if yes, how do we accelerate this? How do we move away from the challenges that clearly these CEOs are confronting when, they're, when they've when they made these commitments, but find it difficult to, to move beyond the current uh, approach? Well, let me first acknowledge that it's tough uh, because all of a sudden now ESNG, environmental, social and governance, come high on the agenda and, and CEOs have already a lot on their plates just to keep their companies going and economies that are not doing so well. And then the pressures from all different directions uh, makes it difficult and frankly many of these CEOs were not prepared for this. We have seen and I've always said that the average tenure of a CEO has dropped to below four and a half years. 40% uh, of the bigger companies have had three CEOs or more since uh, 2010. So we have not created at scale the right leaders. So let me start with that and that's a separate topic and discussion perhaps but that's also where you see the confusion. Uh, the second thing is that the expectations of society have gone up rapidly and COVID has helped accelerate that trend as well. Just as digital has accelerated and in six months we've done probably a five-year trend, so has the demand for companies to be responsible um, corporations. And that probably uh, has surprised some of the CEOs, the speed that that is moving. Having said that, I think there is a bigger group of companies that are trying to make the broader commitments. You've seen it especially around climate change. You see it now also coming in on biodiversity. But having this holistically um, built into your business model, not as CSR or scope one or two, but into your whole footprint of what you are in the world and starting to think of really regenerative business models, not where you're less bad, where we probably find ourselves now for the majority, but actually business models that work actively on having a positive influence on society, we still have a gap. And um, you know, if you ask the American citizens, for example, where most of your audience is, 90% of Americans say um, capitalism is not working for them anymore, uh, both sides of the aisle, by the way. But the same number is also saying we expect businesses to step up. But then when it comes to the social side, they think about 30% of them do. Higher than last year before COVID, but 30% for me is still a abysmal number. And on climate change, they probably they say less than half of them are moving. So the say-do gap is there. The complexities obviously are not easy to deal with. But I think increasingly we're moving. But ultimately, ultimately to make the bigger change that we're talking about here, we need governments involved and actively work with the business community and civil society on putting the right frameworks in place. And we need to also measure what counts. If we continue to have this pressure from the financial market and, and in many jurisdictions operate, frankly, still under a governance that prioritizes shareholder primacy, we're not getting out of that. So measuring systems of what count need to change and the involvement of the governments need to change as probably the two biggest enablers uh, to get to the scale and speed that we need. Coming specifically to the BRT statement, 188 companies in the beginning, 220 companies uh, now, uh, revolutionary for the US, surprising to me because I've always felt that uh, you know multiple stakeholders are important. Uh, your employees probably the first ones. I've also felt, and the, the citizens that you serve, just a small detail, but I've also always felt that shareholder return is not at par with the stakeholders like the BRT is putting out. I think shareholder return is a result of what you do. By serving very well society, by serving the citizens, by addressing these issues of people and planet, uh, and obviously doing that profitably to ensure the other dimension of sustainability is what is going to give shareholders 
the better return long term. And there's increasing evidence from that, increased actually that evidence during the COVID crisis that companies that run their businesses that way, that put ESG firmly in the middle, are doing better. Uh, Morningstar did a study of the funds, the ESG funds, and to my surprise, they found that 89% of the ESG funds actually outperform their uh, benchmarks. So I think the case is increasingly clearer. Uh, there's always a lag effect between awareness and, and, uh, and facts, and then there's another lag between actions and awareness, but I think we're starting to see that being accelerated. Thank you, Paul. And uh, I, as an aside, I just, you know, you use the word regenerative, right, capitalism. And I think increasingly people are talking about that. But it's unclear to some, you know, what does that word actually mean? So if you were talking to a CEO and said, you need to embrace regenerative capitalism, what does he or she do? Well, let's put it in, the, in a very simple way. Before COVID, things weren't working either. Climate change was going to three degrees. That would be an absolute disaster, I think. The majority of people are convinced of that now, at least the people that listen to science. Um, gender equality would have taken us 256 years. I don't think you'd be happy with that, Tansy. And furthermore, inequality has grown. We missed an enormous opportunity 10 years ago during the financial crisis, when only 2.5% of the spending went, and we spent a lot then already, went to greening the economy. The rest actually went to propping up the banking system. And not surprisingly, many felt that at that time, banks were too big to fail, but people were too small to matter. Well, by not addressing the issues, we ended up with Brexit, your US deplorable political situation, as an, what used to be an example of the world has now become a, a soap opera or a tragedy. And we see the same in other countries. So what we are, need to do with regenerative is actually creating something better than where we came from by addressing these fundamental issues. Um, Earth's overshoot day, which is the day that we've used up all the resources that the planet can replenish, was August 22nd this year, which means that we're actually using 60% more resources than the Earth can replenish, which actually means we're stealing from our future generations. This is not anymore a case of being less bad. This is a case of where we are in desperate need to repair, repair our relationship with planet Earth and repair our relationship with our fellow citizens. And that is really regenerative. How does that translate? If I just give one example, you take agriculture. The way we produce food right now is a broken system. Deforestation, keeping smallholder farmers poor, stunted children, 20, 30% of the food wasted in most countries, obesity on the other side, the cost to society are estimated at 10 to $12 trillion of these failures of the commons. 20% of the climate change caused by agriculture as a result of that as a minimum. We will not be able to solve the climate challenge if we don't make agriculture a positive contribution. Why not think about agriculture as positive in carbon capture um, and actually sequestering carbon? It enriches the soil again that we are depleting everywhere in the world. It probably also generates more income for the smallholder farmers and farming actually could become a 20, 30% solution to the climate crisis. In fact, if we would not go that direction, I don't think all the other actions that we can talk about add up to what is really needed. So that is regenerative, moving from this circular economic thinking where we reuse or sometimes upskill is probably not going to work with the enormous amount of middle class still coming in, uh, economies that need to be unlocked in too many parts of the world still. So regenerative thinking, I think, is what we need to build our business models on. Thank you, Paul, very inspiring. And uh, for someone who worked for many years in sustainable agriculture, it's terrific to see how many companies are beginning to get you know, the need for this regenerative approach. So um, I do hear from smaller, small, medium-sized companies that, well, that's great for a big brand like Unilever. They have the resources to invest in this. I can't even come up with the reporting requirements, much less figure out how I'm going to make these investments. Um, so they believe they can't really, um, you know, while they might see that it's important, they, they don't feel that they have the resources to invest. And particularly now with COVID, they're feeling extremely, you know, constrained financially. So how might, how might they tackle this? Where might they focus as, as small or medium-sized businesses? 
No, I'm glad you bring this up because the small and medium-sized enterprises are the backbone of the global economy. As a chairman, uh, just uh, stepping down from the International Chambers of Commerce, where we had 48 million companies globally belonging to that, about 2 billion people are employed in these SMEs. And um, for most of the countries, there are 80 to 90% of their economies. And uh, as you rightly point out, with COVID, about 20 to 30% of them are at risk. They don't have these financial reserves or access to financing that many of the big companies have. So the first thing we are calling for and trying to work now with the G20 that will have a meeting uh, the third week of November is to ensure that the world gets together once more and puts a support packets behind uh, support of the SMEs. Uh, we're advocating for about $5 trillion. So the situation is not that simple. And it is important that we first get these companies to be level-headed and have a positive cash flow. In a company like Unilever, um, uh, we had about 80 to 100,000 suppliers in our value chains. And they were basically SMEs and uh, benefiting from our programs, our supplier code, our training that we put out there. So many of these SMEs are actually tied in to these bigger supply chains and could benefit from that. What is very important for the SMEs to realize is that the ESG trend has, has left the station. We see China making a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2060 and undoubtedly will pull that forward in the coming years. Europe coming out with the Green Deal and, and very progressive uh, circular economy, biodiversity packages. So for a small or medium-sized business to survive longer term, they obviously have to be on trend and many of them are. Uh, but I realize that they don't have as many of the resources or funds of the bigger companies to do something about it. But they have a big advantage. They are nimble, less bu bureaucracy, closer to the consumers or citizens, if you want to, and often much quicker able to uh, pivot their business models. If you look at um, some of the great work that you have done, at the University of Tennessee with uh, ROSI, which actually the methodology, which is incredibly powerful to help companies, small and big for that matter, to, um, to look at, at the uh, sustainability and the financial case of sustainability, um, overwhelmingly shows that you can do a lot of things, even today, that would immediately give you benefits. Many of the SMEs operate under very small margins. But by moving to green energy, which is already cheaper in 60, 70% of the world, by going to um, you know, uh, reusable cups, by looking at waste and very simple things, which we also did in Unilever at scale, gave us savings of over a billion dollars or euros in our case. Uh, the smaller SMEs can also do that and, and, and make use of that. The other thing that the SMEs can do is obviously um, tying into some of the collective efforts, like the International Chambers of Commerce has the uh, SME Climate Hub, uh, also a program, uh, Save Our SMEs, SOS. Uh, I'm the chair for the Secretary General of the UN Global Compact. We have 14,000 basically SMEs. They have a program on make the sustainable development everybody's goal, uh, make uh, sustainable development everybody's goal. And, uh, and some plans behind that to implement that. Now, here is the killer statistic, I believe, that the main changes that you're seeing happening in the different markets are actually happening by these small and medium-sized enterprises. Undoubtedly, they have to adjust their models, but it seems that a lot of them are able to. When I was running Unilever, we already could see the change that was happening in food to be more organic, bio, neighborhood, meat alternatives, vegetarian, flexitarian. But frankly, what always bothered me was these bigger companies were very slow to adapt. And you saw actually in their financial numbers, most of them were showing declines over the last 10 years. And yet the main growth in the sector came from all these smaller companies. In fact, in many of the categories, uh, the bulk of the growth comes, not surprisingly, from uh, companies that have positioned themselves in the uh, industries of the future that are closer to these consumers and not having to deal with innovative dilemmas or big structures and have been able to adapt themselves. Nothing clearer than that 
in food, by the way, where most of that growth is coming from these smaller players, despite only having a market share sometimes of one third or one fourth of the actual growth that they're achieving. And it's interesting to see with venture capital because venture capital is rapidly moving into that direction. On green energy, for example, in the last uh, eight to 10 years, about 70 billion has moved into uh, green energy uh, projects. And most of them have been SMEs. Unfortunately, the Shells or the BPs or the Exxon or Mobiles on the other extreme even are only starting to wake up now. They've missed the boat, the market cap has come down. But meanwhile, many of the other ones have come up and uh, there is now a company that you might not even have heard of that provides uh, green energy that has a, uh, in the Nordics, that has a bigger market cap than Exxon already. So, uh, and these are, these are the SMEs of the future. In fact, if I put my money somewhere, I'd put it on the SMEs. Thanks, Paul. Well, very inspiring for, for anybody involved in SMEs. And, and I want to pick up on one of your points around the market demand and the smaller brands there. So we've actually done some research at the Center for Sustainable Business with IRI looking at consumer purchasing of consumer packaged goods, personal care, and food products. And we found that 55% of the growth came from sustainability marketed oh. products across nine out of the 10 categories. You know, yeah, I mean, 90% of the categories. We looked at 36 of 40 categories. Um, However, what we found, and this is to your point, that it was more often the smaller brands that were stepping out and um, rarely the big legacy brands. Although when we did see the big legacy brands take a step, they actually could dominate the category and win, you know? Well, so markets what, moved them. Exactly. So what is it that's holding these brands, these big legacy brands back at this point? And how can we shift that orientation? Because they can really make, make a huge difference. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, some of that is obviously the normal hurdles of awareness or do you care or it costs money. Uh, some of these old myths that have to disappear and take some time. But, you know, we could work much quicker with individual smallholder farmers, with our little businesses and change their habits to more sustainable habits. We could work very quickly with uh, retailers and, and provide digital and make them more agile. So these SMEs, in fact, supported companies like Unilever far more than we perhaps gave them credit for. But the problem for a company like Unilever is always like, for example, I made a commitment to move all of our agriculturally based materials to sustainably sourced. But for example, and you're well familiar with that, on issues like palm oil, it really means changing Indonesia and changing the government and uh, changing policies, uh, enforcement. And to move things at scale, be it vanilla or be it any of the other crops that, uh, that we have, uh, these are such volumes that are involved that you really need to work on the systems changes to really get to that same speed, which obviously these smaller companies have an advantage because they don't do that. So even in Unilever, where during my tenure, we bought 60, 64 companies. And I was very fortunate that many of the B Corps decided to join us like Seventh Generation, like Maitera, like Puka, T, and many of the others. And they were able to go very fast to get to that sustainable sourcing. And for us, we, we aspire to, and the reason we brought them in was to galvanize faster chains with us. But to do it at that scale takes more time. So there are inherent negatives that these smaller SMEs can exploit. Having said that, I think you can, you can see that we have achieved quite a lot. We moved basically all of our uh, the top ingredients to sustainable sourcing over a 10 year time period. So uh, my, my other message will be uh, bigger companies need to move faster. It can be done. And we've shown that in many areas, not in all, but in many areas, you can move much faster. I'm, a, I'm still disappointed at how many companies are willing to speak up when you have deforestation go up in Brazil, despite having the forest code, when the Serrata gets, um, when the tundras in Russia are burning, we're getting close to a negative feedback loop and we need to be more forceful in terms of attacking that. And that's why I created Imagine, we'll get to that in a minute, but there is some work to do that goes beyond individual companies to allow these companies to move faster. So speaking of that, I mean, this is the decisive decade for keeping climate change to somewhat manageable levels, right? And we, we're already seeing the, the feedback loops. How optimistic are you, and let's go back to your reading perhaps, but that we can change the trajectory? 
what are the steps needed to do so? Um, how do business leaders, uh, you know, what kind of role should business leaders play? And they are stepping up, but we're seeing a real lack of leadership by some business and actually really attacking um, uh, action as well as uh, recalcitrance on the part of government. So how do we, how do we actually change things in this decade? Well, first of all, it's too late to be a pessimist. So I like to quote always Desmond Tutu, who uh, told me once on a panel that we were both on, I'm a prisoner of hope. And I think I am a prisoner of hope. The other alternative doesn't lead to anything. Anytime you get your mind wander off or try to take the easy way out or choose the, uh, the, the wrong versus the harder right, the easier wrong, uh, it, it leads to, to the wrong things. And we've been there. People like us need to operate under a higher level of consciousness and, uh, and uh, responsibility. So I tend to believe we can um, achieve our goals also when it comes to climate change. But it does mean that we need to halve the emissions every 10 years between now and 2050 to stay on a trajectory of maximum one and a half degrees, which already gives us quite a lot of uh, tragedy as you can see around you. Um, by the studies that we've done, by any means that's possible, Tensi. The biggest thing coming out of COVID is um, actually not climate change, it's, it's the risk of social cohesion. We have pushed, we've lost the equivalent of 500 million jobs, according to the ILO. We've pushed 100 million people again into poverty with the latest data from the World Bank, Malpas and his buddies. And, um, and that's just after we've put, pumped in $12 trillion to stabilize these economies. Most of these governments have run out of money. They might not have the courage to spend significant money to recharge. The emerging markets are totally exposed and not getting the help. The risk with climate change being unabated is another 1 billion climate refugees. So the name of the game really is uh, a creation of jobs, especially when it gets to the young and women who always bear, uh, bear a disproportionate uh, burden, if you want to. Then you have to look, if you have to look at job creation, you have to look at which, how do we create jobs that are more resilient, that are more, more inclusive, uh, better paying, etc. And again, study after study, it shows that by retrofitting our cities, our buildings, moving to greener cities, working on the electrification of mobility, restoring biodiversity, changing our energy systems, are actually multipliers in job creation, higher returns on investment, and we would all agree that they are better and more resilient jobs in general. So it would argue for a greening of the global economy. Right now, we are not seeing that in uh, all of the countries of the world. In fact, most of the money has been spent in saving lives and protecting livelihoods. But now we're starting to see that some countries are making bailouts conditional, or some of the spending, especially here in Europe, is behind greening this society. And that's what we need to fight for. Just in restoring our biodiversity, the World Economic Forum calculated we can create up to 380 million jobs, very well identified how that is possible. So we need to get the governments there. What is the biggest short-term issue that needs to be solved? Um, that is what you are all going to do there in, uh, in three weeks or four weeks' time. And that is an important decision you're taking because the role that a country like the U.S. has played and is currently still able to play, I believe, is that role of galvanizing the, uh, the global um, critical mass to move forward. That has been absent over the last four years as many of the multilateral institutions we desperately need have been abandoned, uh, relationships have been broken, but I don't think that is linked to the country. That is linked to some individuals and can be quickly repaired. But the US has to play this role still of driving that ambition, just like John Kerry did and Obama uh, during the Paris agreements. It was crucial to get many of the other countries on board but also to make commitments to help these other countries move things forward. And that's currently absent, which is uh, deplorable, but you know, let's put our efforts 
behind the best we can do behind uh, the decisions that we need in a few weeks time. Thank you, Paul, for that. Um, and, and let me now turn to this question of leadership and what you're doing about it with Imagine, right? If you can share with us your goals, your accomplishments, and where you see things going with, with the organization. So very simply, we've touched on some aspects. When I was CEO, I discovered I stayed in Unilever 10 years. That was long enough for me and good for the company to have a change, in my opinion. But I stayed for the second part after five years. I might have been relatively bored. The strategy was working. People were doing amazing jobs. And, uh, and uh, the added value that I had in the company was probably less than I got credit for. And I started to use the size and scale of Unilever to drive more transformative change outside of the company. And that is many of the things that we have worked together to achieve that. But I also found that uh, you can only do so much if you're a CEO of a company. You're still being seen as representing that company. You have many of the other responsibilities. So I felt getting, um, you know, uh, creating Imagine is really meant to help these CEOs in the areas that they cannot do alone. So if you take climate change and inequality, we believe that in every sector, which has there's some inherent comparability and competitiveness in these sectors, if you bring enough CEOs together across the value chain, which in our theory of change is about 25 to 30 percent, you can actually drive a value chain to a tipping point, which then attracts other companies, which then attracts civil society and governments to put the right frameworks in place. A good example would be around regenerative cotton. We brought 68 companies together in fashion. We started with, by the way, with uh, 30, and it has more than doubled in a year's time. Now we have 68 companies, about 30% of the fashion. Together, they are getting out of single-use plastics. Together, they're moving to regenerative cotton. It could not have been done by any of these companies alone. And many of them are also SMEs, so they benefit from that. We brought 30 of the biggest companies together across the value chain in, in food. And they're looking at, indeed, uh, carbon-positive uh, farming, uh, livelihood step changes for smallholder farmers. And that requires systems changes. And that's where Imagine is focused on. And what we find is that if we bring these CEOs together collectively, they actually become more courageous and they see more areas that are pre-competitive. I always say, and I've always believed, the future of mankind should not be an issue of competitivity. When Unilever invented patents to reduce the use of plastics or to go to uh, concentrated formulas, I always made that available to everybody because uh, you know, there is a common interest here that, uh, that we need to put ahead of our own interest. And that is really what true partnership is all about. That's the partnership for humanity that we need more about. And that's why we need more human leaders for that same reason. Thank you, Paula. I, very, very um, stimulating. And I'm, I'm looking at the long list of questions that people have for you. And I think they're um, motivated by your experience, by what you're doing with Imagine. Um, so let me start first uh, with- Find an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> let me, well, let After me start. all your tough ones. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> let me ask you one from a student, which is, um, what advice do you have for MBA students who are looking to pursue a meaningful career in sustainable business? What kinds of roles and companies would be most impactful? Well, first of all, let me congratulate you by being a student because you belong to 50% of the world population that is under 30 years old and it's your future. So, and increasingly we are realizing all these enormous opportunities that uh, we have in implementing this more sustainable and equitable future. In fact, the uh, sustainable development goals are costing us three to five trillion dollars a year to implement. Just on coronavirus, a failure of not acting is costing us 12 trillion and the clock is ticking. I would argue we are at the point that on any of these sustainable development goals, the cost of action is significantly lower than the cost of inaction. So the, 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 the trend is our friend, it's only going to get faster and the opportunities are going to be abundant in, in any company in the private sector, but I also think in civil society and governments, and we're starting to see that change happening. What you need to do, and I'll keep it general a little bit, is as you pursue your career, be sure that you can find this sweet spot between what you are passionate about, what you're good at, and what the world needs. 
And if you can manage that intersection, you find often that your values and then hopefully the values of the company you join are matched and you'll be a very happy person. It's all about finding that balance because then you have your inner peace to work on the outer peace. No, you know, uh, burnt out people are not going to fix the problems of a burnt out planet. So finding your own balance first and pursuing your passion, your purpose, and then marrying that with whatever institution is probably the best advice I can give. And then the final one is uh, keep a positive attitude. Uh, life is not always easy. I always say you cannot climb a mountain if it's only a smooth surface. Sometimes you have to have a bump. Sometimes you have to descend to acclimatize and go up again. And that's fall down. life. So <laughs> I, uh, and sometimes you fall. I've learned in Unilever, there's a lot of cynics and skeptics out there. And, uh, and sometimes it got under my skin and that was never good. So I learned to really live with that and set the bar higher and thank them for doing me a favor. But don't let that deter you from fighting for what is right. Most of the changes that we now see in the world, um, from Black Lives Matter to the school strikes on Friday <laughs> to many of the other ones, are coming from the young. So keep going. Get organized. Don't just demand a seat at the table. Demand the table. Thank you. Do we have a we have a number of questions about economic inequality? So let me just pull one of them that sort of represents the theme. Um, on income inequality, what are the three concrete things that CEOs can do within their companies to address these issues? And you know, who mentored you and supported you on on tackling that issue? So on income inequality, uh, what um, if you just specifically stick with the company, I think it should go to the whole value chain. The reason that I was so keen on having the tea business and building the tea plantations, I wanted to show that we could create livelihoods for people that were tea pickers, that their children could go to school, that they could have dreams of improving their lives. That's why we created a fair wage commission globally with the unions and others to really bring these standards. So when you talk about diversity, or when you talk about income equality, et cetera, um, or, uh, then you need to do that in the whole uh, blueprint, if you want to, of your business model. Many CEOs think that they can outsource their value chain and outsource their responsibility. That doesn't work anymore. So specifically in Unilever, what we did, the first thing is, and, and I've said that to many people, I'm not ashamed about that, I earn more than I ever thought I would earn in my life. My father came from a family of six children. My fa father was a victim of World War II. His education was taken away, but my father and mother understood how important that was to give it to their children. And fortunately, I grew up in the Netherlands where education was free. Otherwise, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. So when I came into Unilever, I never asked for the salary. It was less than my predecessor at that time, but I also refused any increase over the 10 years I was CEO. I still think it was too much, but that was what it is. And uh, the second thing we did was ensure from day one that not only did we have gender equality in the company, my board was 50-50. We moved from 38% to 50% in gender equality. But actually when we had to show the gender pay cap, it turned out that we had more women in management than men and we actually had a premium the way that it was required to be published. So we spent a lot of time on ensuring that we were leading on things like uh, London wages, which are different than the rest of the UK, that we would to the extreme not participate in companies that, uh, that did not pay their people properly. I remember a company that I shall not name anymore because they've changed, but they were mad at me when I named them. But one of our businesses was providing this direct to consumer delivery and then I found out that the people that actually were doing the delivery and putting themselves at risk being in traffic every day couldn't even make a living from, um, from, from their hourly wages. And if they would get one traffic ticket because they went into the wrong street or took the wrong turn because there's so much pressure on them to make a little bit of a living, it would wipe out the earnings of a week. So I said, we're not going to deliver our products there. So how companies behave and look at that holistically to do the right long-term things is very important. So those are some things concretely, working on commissions to establish minimum wages, uh, making your contingent workers, which we had also plenty of, full-time workers, uh, extending benefits to everybody. We made everybody a share owner of Unilever and in the same plans. 
uh, freezing your salaries and that of management, uh, closing that gap where you can, if it exists based on gender or race or any other discrimination, and then, uh, and then hopefully address some of these issues on, of inequity. Uh, interestingly, in Unilever, that was not our biggest challenge anymore, nor was that played back. And I think part of that is because we actively and overtly uh, attacked them. I think one uh, note on Unilever during the coronavirus uh, pandemic during the summer I noted is that they, the company put in place a program to support small suppliers uh, with financial support, right? And to make sure that they were the ones left at risk, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, when the banks through, didn't come through, when, yeah, to be honest, when the, the, yeah, yeah, exactly, when the banks didn't system. come through, you know, you yeah. had to replace the functions of the banks. The banks yeah. were calling in their loans once more. And, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. so, so yeah, and, exactly. and put a billion in to biodiversity restoration mm -hmm. and put the carbon footprint on the package. I'm very proud of Alan Job because he is doing things with more courage and uh, bigger than I was able to think. So it probably reconfirmed to me that I left at the right time. But it also showed that these companies can do that because they were run on this multi-stakeholder ESG model. They are so much more resilient that even during a crisis, they can accelerate. And that's very reassuring to see. We just need to create the critical mass of those companies. So several questions touch on how do you design the right KPIs for your sustainability strategy? And that ties into some of the challenges that exist around reporting to ESG data and all the different apples and oranges and ways in which they're um, rated. So how, what do you, you know, again, as a CEO of a company, what, how do they put in place the right KPIs and then how do they translate those into um, report on progress for all the stakeholders, investors, clearly, as well as um, civil society workers and others? Well, the right KPIs is obviously, it depends on what is important for the world and what's important for you. And it might be different by sector, some of these KPIs, but broadly there are a group of KPIs that would be all the same in my opinion. And many of them are already available. Um, it used to be, if you go back 50 years or so from memory, the market cap of a company was basically explained by what you published in your income statements or balance sheets. And that was basically your assets, your brands, and, and that was 85%. Now that's only 15 to 20%, partly because we've moved to a service economy and technology, et cetera, but also partly because the world has started to value many of these other variables that we call intangibles, like a company culture, like a pipeline of patterns, like a resilience in your value chain, like a good governance in a company. And any time that these, uh, these other, call them uh, right now, non-measured values are violated, you pay a big price for that. The fact that the Boeings or the GEs or the Wells Fargo's or the Volkswagen's are going through these, these terrible things that cost shareholders tons of money is because they've not been offered about publishing these non-financial measures. If most of the companies now issue purpose statements, I think everybody, including the shareholders, have a right to figure out what, how the company is progressing against that purpose. And that often, requires these S, uh, uh, social, environmental, and governance measures. So there is now for the first time a big effort because that is an alphabet soup, I agree with you. When, when people feel that you need to tip from financial accounting to also include environmental and social accounting, we have SASB, GRI, um, uh, the, the World Business Council was accounting for, uh, for um, social and environmental value. We have IFRS, we have some of the uh, other efforts. Uh, for the first time, they're coming together. The WEF has started an initiative with the International Business Council, which are the biggest companies belonging to the WEF, that brought the four accounting firms together. They've been relatively late to discover their whole new market out there for some reason, unknown to me, but at least they've put themselves together now. They've come out with a framework of 21 measures uh, primary measures, and most of these measures are already available on governance, on gender equality, on pay gaps, and, uh, and that's publicly available. You can Google that. And then I believe there are 36 measures that are more quantitative, but companies could report on that. Unilever put out 50 measures when I started 
uh, 10 years ago or 12 years ago. They were audited by PwC in our case. These uh, 50 measures were all hard measures. They were a little bit revolutionary perhaps, but we could figure out what was important. I thought it was good to do 50 because this transparency creates trust and that trust is the basis of prosperity. Whilst over that period, we have saw the trust in business go down quite drastically to deplorable levels to, as far as I was concerned, with trust in CEOs even lower, Unilever actually was off the charts according to Globescan, even the double the trust levels than companies like uh, Patagonia and others. So it pays to be transparent. We also have on some specific issues like climate, we have the TCFD that you can look at, the Task Force for Financial Disclosure of Climate Related Risk. We have the SDG Benchmarking Alliance who brings the 169 measures of the SDGs into a framework. So whatever your company is, I think there are now some efforts out there that I've mentioned that you could look at to get going. Thank you, Paul. Another group of questions is around the uh, sometimes negative impact of investors, right? So when you first came to Unilever, you um, uh, stopped issuing quarterly guidance, right? And that was a big um, change. And so we had a question about, you know, how, how well did that work? Why aren't other companies doing that? And then also there was some overtures from an activist investor uh, to Unilever. Um, there's a lot of pressures on companies to deliver to that short-term bottom line by investors, although increasingly, of course, we're seeing um, much more focus by investors on ESG. But so how, how do, um, what can investors do better? And, how, and what can corporate leaders do better in terms of educating investors about why these issues matter and why they shouldn't be managing just to a short-term quarterly number? Uh, 10, 12 years ago, we would have had a different discussion than now, Tensi. 10, 12 years ago, we didn't have the data and some people were worried that I would be working for the UN and not put Unilever back on track. And uh, so there was a high level of skepticism. Um, uh, there is no doubt that the trend in the financial market is actually towards the shorter term. The governments have put in so much money that is looking for a home. And that's why you see the stock market being decoupled from the real economy. And then there is a lot of uncertainty in the future. So this future cash flow that companies like Unilever always have by consistent performing is discounted too much. 50% of the CFOs actually say that they would take the wrong decision in their companies for the long-term benefit of their companies if it would negatively affect their quarterly performance. That is absolutely absurd. And we've seen that some of the industries that are now in deep trouble, um, the, uh, the um, airline industry, the oil industry, they've paid out 95 to 100 percent of their earnings to their CEOs or to their shareholders over the last 10 years. And that's just a tragedy. So that shareholder primacy rules, let's not be mistaken about that. I made very clear that we were going to run to a multi-stakeholder model. I made very clear that we were not going to take our decisions anymore on a quarterly basis to attack these worldly issues. So that's why I abolished quarterly reporting, moved our compensation to the long term and um, stopped giving guidance to provide that breathing space for people to get into the right behavior. Now. We are 12 years further now. Now we see ESG as one of the fastest growing asset classes, if I may call it that way. The same with impact investing. Green bonds have just hit $1 trillion. A few years ago, we were surprised it was 100 billion. Um, and it's going very rapidly now. 70% of the new funds that have come in during COVID, uh, no, sorry, 70 billion has come in during COVID into ESG investing. So I think we are at a tipping point there because we have more proof now, hard facts, that it is actually good to invest in more responsible companies and companies that are better positioned to the future. I know, I feel a little bit silly with only my Dutch high school education that I have to explain that to you guys, but at least it's now a fact and people are starting to feel more comfortable about that. So um, I think the main issue that you've seen for CEOs is that they are too long in their jobs, as it's less than four and a half years. They're heavily wrongly incentivized. They cater to the current shareholder base, which might be the wrong base. And, and the boards are not very helpful. 
if I may say. And this is what we see study after study coming back. So we've created a movement globally called Focusing Capital on the Long Term, where we work with the asset owners, the asset managers, and the asset creators to change incentive systems for all of them, to change transparency of where these funds invest in, and to slowly start moving the financial markets to the longer term. There will always be a few that don't buy into that, that think that greed is good. But I think that uh, with governments ultimately involved as well, and some are already, we can change the financial markets, hopefully increasingly again, to serving the real economy and also spending their money increasingly behind achieving these sustainable development goals. It needs financing and it's becoming more attractive. So hopefully mechanisms will be put in place to accelerate the, the, the flow of capital into that direction as well. And that by definition will be longer term. It's very um, uh, cynical actually now that I talk to you, I think about it, that we have to solve these long-term, uh, sorry, these uh, solve with long-term capital, the urgent issues of society. Mm, that's right, that's exactly right. But that's right. what it is. Yep. You know? Well, I have a question from the group that I wanted to share, which is, um, kudos on Imagine, and uh, how can we on the, uh, in this webinar help you uh, with Imagine and help it to become even more of a success? What's the role? Well, we're all in this together. This is not us or me or anybody else. It's a movement, the way I created this. And the reason we called it is Imagine. I went to Yoko Ono. I, at, the, at one point in time, I thought I'm going to create a big movement of the arts. Kofi Annan had passed on. And he was a dear friend and he was a lover of the arts. He collected cartoons and everything. And as a tribute to him, I wanted to create a global movement of the arts where people, because the arts, you can express yourself often in more direct ways than, than we can do in verbal communication and unlock humanity to drive us faster to the implementation of the sustainable development goals. So I saw a lot of artists from all different forms of art, from the um, yo-yo mask to to the Boise's to do uh, Yoko Ono. And she just gave me a little card and uh, I still have the card here. And she said, uh, space transformer. And she wrote down on the other side, imagine. So I thought, well, we might as well call our movement imagine. So if we see um, opportunities to accelerate uh, industries uh, and you can help put these industries together, which is where we're now focused on, and collectively move these industries, that would be for us the most productive thing. Uh, right now, we're building up the capacity to do that properly, uh, but people want action. People want uncomfortable, bigger actions, if you want to, uh, and collectively, we can achieve things that individually we probably desire to do, but, but it's sometimes far more difficult. So that is that movement is where we want to focus on. Sorry, I can't be that was more specific because it depends on anybody, everybody. But I had a, a, a person from a, a pharma company calling me and said, hey, we now see pharma companies working together. We also have a little bit better image in the industry, but we need to create some, attack some big issues like antimicrobial, for example, resistance, or how we deal with future pandemics because we're going to get more. And we need to set ourselves up as an industry to become a force for good. And right now we might be riding the wave of COVID and people want to survive, so they need us. But what about longer term? So we're trying to put about 20 companies together in pharma. So if people see opportunities like that, we're now starting with the financial sector. So we have fashion, food, finance, and hopefully pharma soon. So if you work for any of those companies and don't yet belong to the Courageous Collective, convince your CEO to give me a call. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you for giving us cause for optimism, inspiration, and also very practical tips <laughs> on what we can do with our lives, personally and professionally. Um, as always, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you, learn from you. Um, we will, to answer the questions, we, will, we have recorded this. We will send out the link to everybody. We'll also send a link to the Imagine homepage so you can access that. And Paul, thank you for all you're doing. Have a wonderful day and uh, look forward to our next time. No, thank you and thanks for the opportunity. And if you uh, capture the questions, I'm willing to answer that. I always feel sorry that we don't get to all of them in a short period of time. So if we have the emails and then we can do it together. But above all, uh, be safe and thanks, uh, Tensi, for what you're doing.
Enjoy Thank you for your kind offer. We'll follow up on that, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye.